be beginning a three-part series this time of the year on on the story. The story of, of the king, of the prophet, and of the priest who changed the world. When I say change the world, I probably don't understand the case. Sometimes kings and powerful people change the world by changing the border. Or by leading in an army to conquer and to kill and to destroy. Jesus Christ did not change the world in that way. Jesus Christ changed the world in the sense that he saved the world. And there's no doubt in my mind, armchair historian that I am, or that I even try to be, but there's no doubt in my mind that had Christ not come, there would be no humanity left whatsoever. None. We read of tribes that just disappeared. And we don't know what happened to them. Now some, some we know that they were wiped out, uh, subsumed, if you will, by another tribe. But there are others that didn't fight anyone, or at least that we know of, or had battles, but they just disappeared from off the face of the earth. Interestingly, uh, just a few years ago, we, you might recall that uh, the world was going to end because the Mayan calendar ended. Remember that? It wasn't that long ago. I don't know why all our geniuses couldn't figure it out. It was the Mayans that had come to an end. <laughs> and we really don't know how or why. They just did. We do know that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And how big or how strong or how powerful you are, if you go against Christ, you'll disappear like the Mayans. You might disappear as being controlled or overcome by someone else, or you might find a way to do it on your own. Humanistic man will find a way to embrace his own demise once he turns away from Jesus Christ. It's inevitable. Nothing else could possibly happen. Well, this morning, the birth of the king. Next week, the birth of the prophet, and the week after that, the birth of the priest. The ultimate king begins life as the ultimate outcast. Think about it. He was an outcast. You'd be an outcast too if you were born in a manger. Now I get the idyllic scenes. I get the, 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 the happy manger scenes with the especially live nativity scenes, with very nicely groomed sheep, and clean hay, and all smells eliminated. But truly think about it. To be born and to be laid in a place where animals eat. Have you been around animals that eat? They slobber. And they do disgusting things and disgusting smells. And this is the way this king comes. As an outcast of outcasts, for Pete's sake. He can't even find a room in the outer portions of the inn. And Alfred Edersheim tells us that that was one of the things that made Jerusalem famous. Alfred Edersheim, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. If you can't afford the book, it's a free PDF download nowadays. Probably the premier book on what Christ walked into, or what he was born into. I certainly highly recommend it. Alfred Edersheim was a believing man who apparently came from a Jewish background, loved Christ. <coughs> Points out that Jerusalem was known for its hospitality. It's one of the hallmarks of Jerusalem. You can stay almost anywhere. And this king comes 
and he can't stay anywhere. How does this happen? What is going on? Well, this morning, we want to talk about that ultimate king, beginning life as the ultimate outcast. And my point this morning, part of it at least, is to convince you that if we are seen as outcasts, you and I, in 2015, about to be 2016, if we are seen as outcasts by those who hate Christ, it's not a bad thing. This is why, or this is where, our story of Christ connects with that of the story of the pilgrims that we just looked at. Because they were seen as outcasts. They were seen as people that you wouldn't want to be associated with. <coughs> Jesus Christ came, and when he came, and I get all the happy pictures, but understand this morning, and we're going to see this morning, when he came, almost no one wanted to be associated with him. No one wanted to be connected with this king. It meant trouble on just about every side, especially in the book of Matthew, which is what we'll look at this morning. Did you see the quote in your bulletin from Napoleon? <coughs> a man who understood power. A man who seriously understood power. Talking about this, this king born in an obscure village in an obscure place that we don't even know where it was. Listen to this. I will tell you, Alexander, the great... Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself have founded great empires, but our empires were founded on force. Jesus alone founded his empire on love, and to this day millions would die for him. I think I understand something of human nature, and I will tell you, all these were men, and I am a man. Jesus Christ was more than man. And when Napoleon says there, he says he thinks he understands something of human nature. If you've studied Napoleon, as I briefly have, that's an understatement. That man knew human nature. That man could walk into a room, figure out who was in charge, figure out who he had to deal with, and he could size the person up and figure out his weaknesses almost instantly. That was one of his great, that was part of his genius. A man you would definitely want to stay on your poker game with. He understood human nature. He went on to say, I have inspired multitudes with a devotion so enthusiastic that they would have died for me. That's true. He's not overstating the case, and many did. They killed and they died for Napoleon. But to do this, it was necessary that I should be visibly present with the electric influence of my looks, my words, my voice. Who cares for me now, removed as I am from the active scenes of life and from the presence of men? Who would die now for me? Napoleon talked about this when he was late and incarcerated later. Now I'm present. Who cares about me now? Christ alone. Across the chasm of 18 centuries makes a demand which is beyond all others difficult to satisfy. He has more than a father can demand of his child or a bride of her spouse or a man of his brother. He asks for the human heart. He will have it entirely to himself. He demands it unconditionally and forthwith his demand is granted. Wonderful. In defiance of time and space, the soul of man with all his powers and faculties becomes an annexation of the empire of Christ. This phenomenon is unaccountable. It is altogether beyond the scope of man's creative powers. Time, he concludes. The great destroyer is powerless to extinguish this sacred flame. This is what strikes me most. This is what proves to me quite convincingly that Jesus Christ is God. Indeed, how can it be that one born so obscurely, so insignificantly, can have this great influence, this great amount of time from the time he left? Do you care what Attila the Hun thinks? Do you care what Alexander thinks? Does one thing in your life change today because you think that uh, perhaps um, 
Julius Caesar might be looking over your shoulder. They're removed. They're removed by time, space, geography. But Jesus Christ still is that great axe head to this day. To this day, he splits everything. You come down with Christ and you go one side or the other. You don't sit on the fence. He will have you as his friend or he will have you as his enemy, but he will have you. This is the Cain that was born in obscurity. Let's turn, not to Matthew chapter 1 and 2, but I want to turn to Matthew chapter 12 as we start. Matthew 12, verse 14. Matthew 12, a critical passage in, in Matthew. It's when Christ is officially rejected by those who should have accepted him first. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, this is what we just read, we'll read it again. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. We see that he sends justice to victory. Isn't that what kings are supposed to do? What good is a king that cannot or will not send justice to victory? If a king is all victory, no justice, he is a threat and an act of danger. But if he is all justice and no victory, then he is irrelevant and an act of distraction, and a false hope. But who is this king, and how does he come to us? You see, from Isaiah there, he comes small, almost unnoticeable. And they even say that he, he won't even cry out in the streets. He, he won't have his entourage going before him. He'll do wonder, it's what he will do. Not so much about what he says. And he will send justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will trust. This is a great king. Not just over Israel. Not just over a piece of land in the Middle East. This is a king who will conquer and who will be worshipped by the entire earth? This king, this Christ. <coughs> what did he walk into? How did he come to us? Jimmy and Carol Owens asked the question, how should a king come? And they answer it, even a child knows the answer, of course, in a coach of gold with a pure white horse <coughs> in a beautiful city, the prime of the day, and the trumpets should cry, the crowds make way. And the flags fly high in the morning sun, the people all cheer for the sovereign one. And everyone knows this is the way that it's done, that's the way the king should come. Even a commoner understands he should come for his treasures in his houses and lands, he should dine upon summer strawberries and milk, and sleep upon bedclothes of satin and silk. Jimmy Carroll Owens have watched a couple of Disney movies here. And high in the hills, castles should glow. The lights of the city like jewels below, and everyone knows the way that it's done. That's the way that the king should come. But how did this king come? The answer, with a little bit of imagination, I suppose. A star-filled night into Bethlehem rode a weary woman and a weary man. And the only sound of the cobblestone street is the shuffle of the ring of the donkey's feet. 
and a king lay hid in a virgin's womb. There were no crowds to see him come. At last, in the barn of Manger of Hay, came, and God incarnate lay there. The writer Matthew is concerned to let us know that he is presenting a king. Matthew, for example, mentions David more than any other, other gospel writer 15 times altogether. The other gospel writers combined mention David 19 times, just four times more. If you want to know <coughs> the argument that this is a king that came, Matthew is where you want to go. So let's go back to Matthew. Matthew starts with the genealogy of Christ. And he ends in verse 12 by saying, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity of Babylon are 14 generations. From the captivity of Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. I just stopped to briefly notice that. To make the point that those who want to say that the Bible is accurate spiritually but inaccurate historically have a huge problem in their hands because of verses like this. Because right after this, in verse 23, okay, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, as it call, calls the call name Emmanuel. You mean to tell me, you mean to tell me that Matthew can get it right about a virgin bearing a son and can't get it right about the generations? Now, once you attack the scriptures historically, you attack them every other way. Well, let's look at chapter 2 and see what this outcast does to people. See how comfortable everyone was. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen the star in the east and come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. <coughs> so they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented <coughs> gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt, I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard, was heard in Ramah, Lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, 
that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. This story of the birth of this king really starts with and is quite intertwined with the story of another king. That king being Herod. Herod was a great king. Let's not underestimate what he was capable of doing. And in fact, what he did. And in order to understand what Christ, what, what Christ came to, we have to understand this man Herod. We look at a man who was so threatened by a baby that he had to go into Bethlehem and in its environment and kill all the two-year-olds that were two-year-old males. And we look and say, isn't that terrible? But I want to tell you something. For Herod, that was just another day at the office. That's what he did. I still remember, as a very young child, my mother reading this story to us out of the Bible made quite an impression on me. I, I had been very young. Um, I have two younger brothers, one ten years younger. He would have been born at the time, but two younger sisters, I believe, at the time. I can't, I, I can't remember how young I was. And my mother read this to us, and she said, you know, if this would happen today, she said they, and I had my younger brother, he was 16 months younger than I, than I was, his name was John. Is John. And my mother looked at us and said, okay, if this happened today, she said they wouldn't kill Joel, but they would kill John. Kind of brought it home. Who was this man? Herod. And what was he ruling over? From Alfred Edersheim again, one could have imagined himself almost in another world, a sort of enchanted land in the Jewish metropolis, meaning Jerusalem, the metropolis of Judaism, when the silver trumpets of the priests woke the city to prayer, where the strain of Levite music swept over it, where the smoke of the sacrifices hung like another Shekinah over the temple, against the green background of Olivet, or when in every street, court, and housetop rose the booze of the Feast of Tabernacles, and at night, the sheen of the temple illumination threw long, fantastic shadows over the city. Or when at the Passover, tens of thousands crowded up the mountain with their paschal lambs, and hundreds of thousands sat down to the paschal supper. <coughs> it would be almost difficult to believe that heathenism was so near, that the Roman was virtually and soon would be really master of the land, or that a Herod occupied the Jewish throne. The Jewish throne. This is not David. This is not Joshua. This is Herod. Yet there he was, the pride of his power, and the reckless cruelty of his ever-watchful tyranny. Everywhere was his mark. Temples to the gods and to Caesar, magnificent and magnificently adorned. Outside Palestine and its non-Jewish cities, towns rebuilt. And Edersheim goes on to mention town and fortress after fortress that Herod himself had built. Not like by with his own hands. But he was a master designer. And he was a military man. And he was a man that would, and we're going to talk about him later like this, he was a man that would be very popular today. He knew how to compromise, and he knew how to find out where the power was, and he knew how to get in, into the parade and run up faster than everybody else and get in the lead. He was a master politician, <clears throat> the kind that we honor today. Yes, I'm talking about Herod. He built towns, he built castles, he built fortresses, and of all the ones that um, Edersheim mentions, there's one that lasts today, it still exists today, and then of course is Masada, there in the Middle East. It seems almost incredible that a Herod should have reared the temple, and yet we can understand his motives. Remember what the temple was called, my friends? 
Remember what they called it? They called it Herod's Temple. It's an amazing time. You worship in Herod's Temple. And it is said that Herod's Temple outshone Solomon's. <clears throat> That a Herod should have reared the temple, yet we can understand his motives. Jewish tradition had it that a rabbi had advised him in this manner to conciliate the people, or else thereby to expiate the slaughter of so many rabbis. Apparently, some rabbis had stood up to Herod, and Herod did what Herod did. He killed them all. But then he was you know, sort of put out with the people, with the Jewish people. So in order to placate them, he built a temple. He's a great builder after a while. After all, build things all over the place. Build a temple. Probably the desire to gain popularity and superstition may alike have contributed as also the wish to gratify his love for splendor and building. At the same time, he may have wished to show himself a better Jew than the rabble of Pharisees and rabbis who perpetually would cast it in his teeth that he was an Idumean. He was not a real Jew. Whatever origin he was Edersheim goes on to say he was a true king of the Jews as great or greater than Solomon himself how do you think an announcement from people from the east the travel a long way in a great caravan. How do you think that announcement would settle on a guy like this? Let's take a look at this, Herod. This is from biblicalarchaeology.org by Gordon France. Who was he? Well, Herod continued to purge rival families. He eliminated his brother-in-law, Aristobulus, who was at that time an 18-year-old high priest. An 18-year-old high priest. By the way, guess who made him an 18-year-old high priest? Actually, didn't make him an 18-year-old high priest. He made him a 17-year-old high priest. Herod himself. He was drowned, Aristobulus was, by Herod's men in the swimming pool of the Winter Palace in Jericho because Herod thought the Romans would favor him as a ruler instead of Herod. He had his mother-in-law, Alexander, executed in 28 BC. He killed his second wife, Miriam. She was his beloved Hasmonean bride, whom he loved to death. <laughs> Around 20 BC, Herod remitted one third of the people's taxes in order to carry favor with them. However, he did set up an internal spy network and eliminated people suspected of revolt. He also had three of his sons killed. First two, Alexander and Aristobulus, the sons of Miriam, were strangled. That's a different Aristobulus. They got killed so many people, started to kill people the same name. Hard to keep them straight. His first two sons were strangled. The last one, only five days before Herod's own death, was killed as well. Herod the Great. Quite a name. Quite a name for this guy. The Great. Herod the Great became extremely paranoid during the last four of the years of his life. On one occasion, 7 BC, he had 300 military leaders executed. On another, he had a number of Pharisees executed in the same year after it was revealed that they predicted to his wife. that by God's decree, Herod's throne would be taken from him and from his descendants and the royal power would fall to her and any other children that she might have. With prophecies like these circulating within his kingdom, is it any wonder Herod wanted to eliminate Jesus from the wise men revealed the new king of the Jews? This is who this man was. Now by this time you're asking, hey, a pastor, I thought we were going to hear about the birth of Jesus. Why are we hearing so much about Herod? Well, I hope to make that clear a little bit later on because I don't think we can truly understand the mission of Christ if we don't understand 
when he came. He could have come at a more peaceful time, but he didn't. And he could have come to a more benevolent ruler, and less paranoid, and less wicked, but he did not. So Edersheim sums it up for us as he died. So ended a reign almost unparalleled for reckless cruelty and bloodshed, in which the murder of the innocents of Bethlehem formed so, but so trifling an episode among the many deeds of blood as to have seemed not deserving of record on the page of the Jewish historian. And what he's talking about there is Josephus. Josephus did not mention the slaughter of the innocents in his antiquities. And Edersheim is saying, we know why. Because the guy killed so many people, killing a few innocents in Jerusalem doesn't even merit his attention. <coughs> but we can understand the feelings, Edersheim goes on to say, the people towards such a king. They hated him. They detested his semi-heathen reign. They abhorred his deeds of cruelty. The king has surrounded himself with foreign counselors and was protected by foreign mercenaries from Thracia, Germany, and Gaul, modern-day Germany and France. So long as he lived, this is Herod now, so long as he lived, no woman's honor was safe, no man's life secure, an army of all powerful spies pervaded Jerusalem. Nay, the king himself was said to stoop to that office himself. <coughs> if private enmity led to denunciation, the torture would extract any confession from even the most innocent. This is the one who would react when the king, the real king, was born. Now here's what we want to talk about this morning. Here's what we must understand. And if it seems like we're coming against an idyllic picture of Christ being born, we are this morning. Because in Matthew's Gospel, there's almost nothing idyllic. There's almost nothing calm. There's almost no one that's confirmed in their present status and told, just keep going, everything's going to be okay, it's all wonderful now. We do have other pictures like that, certainly in Luke, but not in Matthew. Because there's a king coming... And this king is going to send forth justice into victory. And if you're a person who is not into justice, you're going to have a problem with this king. And let's look at the problems this king creates. Joseph and Mary. Seriously inconvenienced. Were they not? Just cruise on down to Bethlehem. Well, first of all, the inconvenience started with the, uh, we see in Luke, with the tax that was laid on people. I have enough trouble paying taxes, or my wife does the bookkeeping there. It's hard enough to pay it from your own living room or office or whatever. Can you imagine getting on a donkey and traveling? Miles on miles with a pregnant wife, just to pay your taxes! This king is upsetting people. And it starts really with Mary and Joseph, but doesn't end there. How about this? Verse 13, chapter 2. Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child of his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek this young child to destroy him. Turns out, the trip to Bethlehem was kind of like a walk in the park. Get up and get out. Now, if people that are trying to kill them get a hold of them, they will do it. So you got to get out of here, Joseph. Uh, we, we don't know much about Joseph. We know he's a carpenter. Carpenter guy kind of sounds like a guy who wants to settle down. Right? Build business. Get to be known to the community. <laughs> Not too much settling down going on here. Mary, Joseph, completely inconvenienced. And it didn't end there. Finally, the angel of the Lord tells him that his Herod was dead. But he doesn't want to go back home. He can't go back home where he wanted to go, where he would have been known, 
where people probably would have utilized his carpenter skills, he has to go to a different place. So Mary and Joseph inconvenienced. Herod, angry. Verse 16, was sit with Herod, we saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. The Jewish ecclesiastical leadership scared out of the minds. If you and I had been living that, we'd have been thinking every day about how to placate and how to keep happy this guy, this beast on the throne named Herod. That would consume you every day. And when he became angry, one thing happened. People were killed. People always died when Herod got upset. So you'd be thinking about it all the time. How can we keep myself safe from this, this animal? And so we see why. <coughs> Verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Do you get it now? <laughs> We've been waiting for the Messiah for all these years, hundreds of years, and now he's here, and he's nothing but trouble. Does the Christ you believe in just affirm everything just the way it is? If that's the Christ you believe, you better check the Christ you believe. The Jewish ecclesiastical leadership frightened Herod angry. The wise men rejoicing at first. But not even that lasted that long. Look at what happened with them. Verse 10. They see the star again. They rejoice with exceeding great joy. And when they come to the house, they give them gifts, but look at verse 12. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. What do you think that, like, what, what do you think that little trip looked like? I think it looked like the same one that they came with. We don't know this, but I'm kind of thinking that they were divinely warned in a dream that it was at night. And says that being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. It appears, I can't really prove it, but it appears as if they all had the same dream. They had the dream. Probably at night. What do you think happened next? I just had a dream. What was it? I was told, I was told to get out of here because that guy Herod, who we thought was going to worship him, is going to try to kill, kill a child. And kill us. And we were told to get out. And I had the same dream. I think I told you they all the same dream. It's the middle of the night, probably. What do you think happens next? Hey, hey, hey. I mean, I have a lot of sleep. Um, we'll call the service in the morning and trot on out of here. No way. No way. No way in the world. They called their servants right then and there. They cranked up the cameras and they got out of there. In the middle of the night. And do you think? You think they might have like been uh, you know putting you know putting the slack to the camels? Like, come on, move. I wonder when it was when they thought that they were safe. They had to have known that they were in deep trouble until they got back to their own country. They were rejoicing and then fearful. So Joseph and Mary completely inconvenienced. Herod angry. And in a killing mood. 
the Jewish ecclesiastical leadership frightened. The wise men rejoicing at first and fearful. Finally, the innocents, dead. Who is this king that causes this kind of trouble? It comes when he comes. And that's what we want to turn to here as we, as we wrap up this morning. Why did he have to come at such a time? <coughs> to such a place? And challenge the authority of such a wicked and powerful ruler? See, Herod had it all. There are rulers out there that have the wickedness, but they don't have the power. They can't put their plans in place like they want to. Oh, they would if they could. And they'd be here if they could, but they don't have the power. Thankfully, there are others, more rare, that have the power, but don't have the wickedness. They don't have those kind of designs on people. Here had both. He had the wickedness and he had the power. One of the most wicked and powerful people that we know of in history. And Jesus Christ comes to challenge this guy? Why? Four things about Herod that you need to know. First of all, as we apply this, <coughs> Herod represents Adam all grown up. What keeps wickedness in check? What kept Adam in check? Adam had no army. He had no history. He had no powers of intimidation. Herod had all these things. But what happens to wicked, vile man when he gets power? He looks like Adam all grown up. Can't wait to destroy and go against what God has done. When Adam gets power, he looks like Herod. Secondly, Herod represents all of us if we have what Herod had. He had power. He had money. He had smarts. He first gained power at the head of an army, so he was a general. He was a tremendous architect. You can still see that today if you go to Masada. There was literally nothing this man couldn't do. We now praise what we call the Renaissance man, right? Nietzsche praised what he called the Superman. This is Nietzsche's Superman, my friends. This is it. You know, those extra smart people that have brains, intelligence, and ability the regular stiffs don't have. Nietzsche, who hated the idea of democracy, who laughed at the idea of giving the vote to common people. He said, look at these people. They can't even brush their teeth. They can't even keep clean. They're crawling with lice. They're disgusting. They're filthy. You're going to give the vote to these people? Are you kidding me? Nietzsche was all about the man who could rise above. Nietzsche would have loved Herod because he hated Christ. Thirdly, Herod represents the man God. And this is where we see the clash. Herod was the ultimate man who thought he was God and wanted to be God. This is what it looks like, my friends. And Herod also shows us that the God-man will always be offensive to the man-God. Think about this. We have it in our heads today that Jesus is kind of floating around from campfire to campfire and place to place and house to house. And everybody just felt better as they could identify that halo over his head. Well, think about this, my friends. 
Think about how he came and just caused problems wherever he went. And he caused the biggest problems to the most wicked people. Think about it. Herod was a wicked man. And you know what? Those Pharisees, those, those scribes and leaders in Jerusalem, weren't so great themselves. Because instead of embracing the Messiah now, they were troubled. No, he's not now. Not here. This is the worst time if he was really the Messiah. He wouldn't be coming now. You see, my friends, listen to me, please. This time that we live in, when we as Christians are not supposed to be offensive, do you understand that Jesus Christ was offensive before he could even talk? He offended everyone, and he offended most of the man God. And don't, and please understand, we live in a time when every little man is his own God. That's what political correctness really is all about, is it not? Can't offend the little gods running around. And Jesus Christ offended this man, and he couldn't even talk. Jesus Christ living and breathing is an offense to all the little man gods running around out there. And if you think you can get along with little man gods and get along with Christ at the same time, you're mistaken. You're going to have to make a choice. In the end, in the end, the man God and the God man are locked in bitter conflict. And one will clear the field of the other. In history, this God man, this king, his authority does not stop with his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. Did you know that? Look at the authority he has here. It's an amazing thing. Herod understood who this God man was, probably better than most. There are those dear folks that believe that Herod and Christ could have somehow got along. <laughs> Herod was threatened by Jesus Christ and he should have been. All wicked people. All those who hate justice should be threatened and will be threatened and are threatened by this man. Is it, we see it here this day. Why in the world would Marxist dictators like Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin be threatened by 66 books written 2,000 years ago? Who cares? I'll tell you who cares. <laughs> Wicked people care. They care a lot. They care almost more than we do. Because they understand the threat. I may have mentioned this before, forgive me if I have. Listen to a radio program one time as we wrap up. And this speaker was saying that um, only if Herod would have, would have understood the spiritual nature of Jesus' kingdom. They wouldn't have had to go kill him. Because Jesus, Jesus is a spiritual king, you see. And Herod was, was in charge of you know, the day-to-day the, the -day activities of the kingdom. And of course, the two have nothing to do with each other. Are you serious? That was a serious statement made on a radio program I was listening to one day. Are you nuts? You, you, you mean those who believe in Christ could somehow worship Herod, who, who, who demanded worship, and Christ at the same time? You mean those who believe in Christ could stand idly by while he killed the innocent and say nothing? That is what we are being asked to do today, my friends. We're asked to, we are asked to get along with those who hate Christ. And you know what? Here's a newsflash. Christ does not get along with those who hate Christ. He doesn't get along with them. What do you think we are going to do there? You know, 
Christ could have come at an easier time. But you know what? I think the timing of his coming illustrates that this king can conquer and will conquer the most powerful and the most wicked. And I think that's what the timing of his coming shows us. There will be nothing that stands in the way of this Christ. Neither power nor wickedness will be able to stand up to him. He will conquer it all. And it began here. Shall we pray? May we love this king. This king that will, he will, turn justice into victory. He will destroy his enemies. And he will protect his people. And those that are war with him will go down to inglorious defeat. Oh Lord God, Lord God, may our allegiance be to this king. And may all other allegiances fade by the side of the road and in the dustbin of his history compared to this great king. May we embrace this king. May we understand that this king will not leave us comfortable necessarily or, or not change us. But may we love this great king. The great king who became the great priest not only rules us, but saves us from our sins. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.